Welcome back to another amazing edition of Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller. I'm joined by my co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and amazing producer, Brian Atkins. We have an incredible guest for you today, Arielle Astoria. Uh, we'll be sharing her bio here in just a second, but I just, I gotta say, I've been thinking a lot about relationships, and it's occurred to me that relationships are the water we swim in. And for a lot of us, that water has gotten kind of shallow and kind of dirty, kind of muddy. And if you're like, well, no, not me, it is it is just something I feel like that can be so um, insidious and, you know, gosh, and even extreme. I mean, this whole uh, no contact trend and, and, and estrangement and the hurt and the heartache that is happening out there. And when I say out there for so many of us, it's it's in here. It's in our own lives. And so I just I'm so grateful to be able to bring this show to you because we are so passionate about the transformational opportunity that relationships afford all of us. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about relationships today with Ariel. So with that, let me uh, let me make the introduction. Ariel Astoria is a published and commissioned poet, author, actor and model. In 2016, she released her EP of poetry and music titled Symphony of a Lioness. In March 2023, Arielle released her first solo book of poetry titled The Unfolding, An Invitation to Come Home to Yourself, published by Harper One. Arielle has shared her work through custom spoken word pieces, workshops, and themed keynote talks with companies such as Google, So Far Sounds, Lululemon, December, TEDx, The Skims Campaign by Kim Kardashian, and so many more. Arielle has a huge, engaged, beautiful social following and is a muse to many of us. Arielle, one of the things that I love about your book, just it caught me right out of the gate. Words not for the ears, but for the soul. I was like, ooh, yeah, baby. And and it, it it's exactly how it, it reads. So we are so grateful to have you on our show. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I love that. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, it was a huge get for Skims, Kim Kardashian's shapewear <laughs> company, to get you aligned with their brand. It must have been very yeah. cool for you to work with such a popular, huge company. But I am curious, knowing what we know about Kim Kardashian, how she has set a new standard for unrealistic beauty and how Skims is largely about making people look smaller or, or changing how they look. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile your advocacy for body positivity with what Kim and Skims represent to so many people? Yeah, it's funny being a part of the origin of something and then watching what it turns into. Um, so being a part of that first campaign, I mean, there were so many different women and people on set with me, um, different bodies and colors and abilities and backgrounds. And um, and I am like, I'm not your typical like get on set and not talk to you kind of person. I love talking to the people I'm on set with. Yep. And so I was talking to everyone. Mm -hmm. I learned one of the one of the women who modeled the director just so happened to always go to her family owned taco restaurant and was like, oh, do you model at all? And she was like, no. And she was like, well, do you want to be a model? And that was one of the women I was on set Lunch. with. So it's really interesting to see the conversations and the marketing that goes behind birthing something and then obviously seeing what mm -hmm. it has shaped into. I will say I aligned mm -hmm. with the origins of what Skimp started as, and that mm -hmm. was so in tune with who I was. And it was the first time mm -hmm. also that I had gone on to a job as a thinking I was going as a model. Um, but then once I got on set, they were like, oh, this is the poet, right? This is the poet. And so I didn't know is... it was video until I got in the room. Like we were there for hours and it was like Holy a huge cow. studio. So some of us are in this like holding space where you're getting your hair, your makeup. That's where I'm eating snacks in my white robe and I'm talking to everybody. And there's a bunch of secret things happening in a whole other room. And so no one knows what's happening in that room until you get in that room. 
And so it was hours before I even knew what I was doing. I thought it was just photo and then I would walk away, but it was actually a video and some Polaroids. It wasn't mm-hmm. actually even digital photos for me. Mm. And so when I got there and I got on set in these tiny, tiny, tiny little hills that almost made me pass out, I'm like 5'8 in a size 12 shoe. And they had all these very tiny European heels. And they're like, this could fit, right? And I said, no, 100%, they cannot. So I tried to put them on and walk over to set, couldn't. I had to put them on when I got to my mark when I was there. And then as I'm trying to get my tiny shoes on and stand there, um, they're like whispering. They're like, so then it was like, oh, you're the poet, right? And I was like, yes. I was like, usually in most contexts, I'm either the poet or I'm the model, or I'm the actor. Very rarely do they co- coexist, you know, outside uh, of me. All intersect. Mm-hmm. All intersect. And so I was like, yes. And so they're like, oh, when we record, can you do something for us? And I was like, sure. So I did my poem that had to do with my body because those were the conversations we were happening that were happening. One of the other women that were highlighted in this yeah. beginning campaign was a woman that um, can got freed from prison and because that's like another part of her work is I, as I've a heard lawyer. about this it, what a story and so I'm mm-hmm. like there were so many things that I was like okay yes this and I was I am not I was I'm not a Kardashian person I I didn't I don't mm-hmm. I still can't really tell all of their names like I still I don't like I wasn't in that world until I got a part of this campaign but I will say the yeah. origin of it was very aligned to not just body positivity, but just the idea of body neutrality, the idea of constantly being in your body and having that journey mm-hmm. and awareness of what it means to come home to yourself um, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And so at some point in time, um, that was what they were about. And and now it, it has formed into something different and it it is less aligned, but the origins of it were very mm-hmm. in tune with what I was about. Um, and I and and what they were initially about, yeah. Well, and what a beautiful thing. I mean, just it must be so exciting and empowering when you think about just how much of an inspiration you are to so many millions of women, mm-hmm. right? That get to see you yeah. just show up so beautifully, Thank like you. that, and you know, and um, I mean, I, I hear you when you say, you know, it sounded like it it shifted. A mm-hmm. bit. Do do you feel like? Do you feel kind of disappointed, or do you feel any regret, or do you just? I mean, I'd be curious. Um, no, no regret. Um, no disappointment. I think disappointment would imply that mm-hmm. I'm surprised by what it is. I'm not. To, I think that's very mm-hmm. much so. Maybe where it was always going to be birthed into. I don't know. I'm not a shapewear mm-hmm. person. <laughs> you know, like I, I don't. Mm-hmm. I think I own it just to have it for set. And other than that, I don't. It's like not my vibe. I would say, I do say her underwear is like soft. Like I don't even buy the actual shape oh. wear. She has a bunch of other uh-huh. stuff. The underwear is super soft and the PJs are really soft. So I have my set and I, that's pretty much it for me. You know, um, there are other brands that feel more aligned and more connected. So I'm not disappointed. I think it, it is what it was going to be. And it also will rode this wave of just a lot of brands that said we're inclusive and and we're making efforts to make sure all bodies feel safe and welcome and have a space to find clothes that mm-hmm. feel good in their skin. But again, we find that those conversations like that, um, like racial inclusivity, are all very trendy-like and, and they get rode yeah. until it's not fundamentally cool or trendy or talked about anymore. And then so many brands, yes. unfortunately, mm-hmm. release that. And, it, and it's a bummer. Um, because I do think this is something that we have to realize needs to be in 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 the um, heartbeat and in the soil of what we do and who we are, and not just on the surface of it. And it only becomes a fad; it only becomes a trend because we keep it on the surface. And so, yeah, it was yeah. a bummer. Um, but I do think it just kind of added to the conversations of a lot of brands um, and a lot of places that just were like, "We're about it," but only for two years <laughs> and then we're not you know which <laughs> well, is just to- totally unfortunate yeah. yeah i mean but you know i don't know why i feel like i'm defending capitalism here you know when i think <laughs> about dove um real beauty remember that sure. started like 15 mm-hmm. years ago and we mm-hmm. saw older people you know 
beautiful women that were older and, mm-hmm. and, and, and all the, you know, all these different ways that, that broke the, the traditional young, yeah. skinny, white mold. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. I, you know, as much and, as it's just disappointing at the same yeah. time, it feels like at least corporate America has woken up enough to sure. say, and I, I, I often, I feel like that sometimes how change happens, it's yeah. three steps forward, two steps back, five steps forward, yeah. four and a half steps back. Mel, I do think it was just like, I mean, from a nerdy kind of Marvel break off the multiverse kind of conversation, I do think it broke the multiverse of things. I do think it like created yeah. this, yes. like what what is it in Loki where, you know, there are these people who like, no, you messed up the system of how things were quote unquote supposed to go. I do think we created a hole in that sphere. Um, I do think we created a space for I'm seeing more, you know, um, more uh, bodies with different um, elements and, and different pieces. Like I've, I follow this one girl who's like so cute and she has like one arm and like she's so fashionable and, and like her whole conversation is like, yeah, there needs to be more people like me. She's still a, a white girl, but she's still like it's still in this like case of like there needs to be more room. So, yeah. Skims did have and they still do one thing that you're right that that was a big change is like even just their shades of nude Uh being like not just light nude and dark nude and black like there's like five shades of nude. Yes. Yes. Including like two different pale ones. And it's really create that that I have seen changes, Mm -hmm. especially like you think about Misty Copeland to the ballerina. She Mm. I believe until recently was still dyeing her own shoes like mm. to match her skin tone because wow. they were all French ballerina pink and she was taking yeah. her makeup yeah. and tinting them so that it would blend in with her legs and it's like oh my gosh she's been famous for decades now mm-hmm. and how how has this industry not caught up so yeah just in that the conversation Absolutely. and if you think about Dove and I'll say I was a Dove real beauty ambassador back when I was an influencer quote unquote <laughs> and they are amazing it does make sense to be suspicious of people's objective, you know, goals sure. when it's based in capitalism. But that being said, when Dove started doing real beauty, people had never seen that. Yeah, like that yeah. was a courageous was a move. Revol- it yeah, was. I, I, I'm going to give yeah. props to the, you know, to the Unilever folks because it was, yeah. you know, overdue, and they and mm-hmm. they did it, and they got it. I mean, here's the thing about I feel like courage, it, you know, courage, and and again, yes, you can say, well, it's it is. Um, self-serving but it, it doesn't make it wrong right and mm-hmm. when i think um just the the courage it takes to to go against the grain yeah um and say hey we're gonna we're gonna change how mm-hmm. how people are portrayed i mean it seems so crazy that people were portrayed so uh, you know one-dimensionally in the yeah. past but 100%. but it does take courage and i feel like and that's at the heart is- of you well, that, yeah, and that's the heart of what you do, Ariel. Thank you. I mean, if there's one word I could take away from reading your beautiful book, it's mm. it's courage. Mm. Thank you. Um, it is it is a scary thing, though, for sure. I think anyone in a courageous world, or even I've been thinking a lot of my husband and I, we just finished watching um, the Mr. and Mrs. Smith series with Donald Glover, and um, yes. we also watched Beef. And in both of those, I found like this, this idea of, and it's, it's still a ruminating one, but this psychosis of truth and like, why does telling the truth make us feel so crazy often? Um, and it's just because it's not something we do a lot of. And so it's a, a lot of courage. I think it just comes from like, yeah, but why are we afraid or um, opposed to, to this in the first place? Why would our yeah. our natural go to not be telling the truth, not be pushing the grain on things, and and willing to have conversations, and also willing to risk and fail for a moment, and then pivot where we need to, and because so much is at risk within capitalism, there's so little risk for that to want to happen. Um, it's just like follow the trend until you don't anymore, and that's that's been the thing is follow the trend and follow the trend and you you make money off of following the trend and and realizing like okay but what if there's one person who again kind of counters um that multiverse of things and is willing to shake it up a little and what do we do then then we create this new not trend but this new normal this new 
um, soil that actually does flourish and create things. Um, but we were really afraid of it at first. And so, I mean, my name, Ariel, means Lion of God. So I didn't really get a whole lot of options to not be courageous, whether I thought that for a long time or not. <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of lioness references in your work. Mm-hmm. I do. Yeah, it's it comes from my name and it comes from my name, you know, being used as a like a remember who you are kind of thing. But in a way of also like remember your yeah. box um, and and really having to learn to like, Ew. oh, I am remembering who I am. And actually, it's 100 percent outside of that box. <laughs> um, and so that's been like I think I played around with it a lot in the unfolding because I was my reclaiming of my name and what it meant to me. Not how it was given to me, but what it meant, what it means to me and how I step into that identity um, and finding what courageous means for me, even if it goes against the grain of, of so much of what's happening around yeah. me. And speaking of that, we recently were reading about um, your um, changes with your faith. And mm-hmm. your church that you were, were yeah. very invested in in the past and how how things have changed in that way. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I know we can relate. Yeah, <laughs> both yeah. Of us. absolutely. No, I mean, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a pretty evangelical home. And then halfway through um, my parents being youth pastors and being in different parts of ministry when I was about 12 or 13, um, they both went to seminary. So we all moved out of our four bedroom, five bedroom home. And then we all moved to a three bedroom apartment on seminary so that my parents could go to school and get their get their degrees. Um, and, wow. and so I have very vivid memories of like, being a church kid and always growing up in church and there's a lot of pictures of me running around in a dress barefoot and my shoes are somewhere else and we're just in between pews like that is so much of my upbringing and I think that will always be the part of who I am I'm I think I don't I feel too much and I am in tune to too much to not be a spiritually in tuned person um so I'm grateful for that I do think I for myself though I had to undo a lot of what I was given of just what it means to have a faith as a woman, what it means to have a spirituality as a person who likes being in their underwear on social media, you know, what it means to be in my body (laughs) at all, what it means to practice yoga and how that, you know, belongs with my faith and with my spirituality and not contradicts it or negates it or destroys it even. Mm. And then also choosing to marry someone who loves to ask questions and explore and open up the wide box of mystery and 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 excitement and unknown and and that being really terrifying to the like the this is what we believe and that's it um and so it's been quite the journey of of unfolding hence hence the book of just like kind of undoing all of this but then at the same time being like oh but some of this still really fits like some of this I still really I still really love a battle song sometimes like I still really love being like, in community with people of faith I still really love those like soaking worship videos on YouTube that are like 30 40 50 minutes two hours to three hours long I still love those things I still can't help but find yeah God things in the universe and in, in nature I just I think that is just who I am but it had I had to undo a lot of the the should and should not the what it can't and and what it shouldn't look like and and this isn't it and that's not God and this isn't you know belonging and I'm like how about I had a friend who was like it all belongs like and I and I've been really leaning into yeah. that of like oh yeah it all belongs actually and I have already been in that space of like I was going to yoga retreats and speaking at churches and things like that and yeah there's a video that we found, I, I think it's relatively recent, about you talk about um, icky political connotations with evangelicalism. And as somebody who it's like mm. loves Christ's message, you know, I love a lot mm. of the, uh, you know, main mainstream yeah. and, and not mainstream, you know, religion's message <laughs> messages at their core. They're beautiful and they've done wonderful things. And yet, you know, you feel like very often uh, religion has gotten really politicized. Mm-hmm. So I just I'd be curious when you talk about kind of the icky political connotations. Um, what yeah. what do you mean by that? And you know, and how how has that yeah. kind of caused you to either step away or or kind of 
rethink your faith? Yeah, well, I think where that re- where that makes me go to first is so much of of what I was given was that we are Christian, we are this religious identity before we are anything else. So I didn't understand a lot of my blackness as a black woman in America because I was only given you're a Christian one in America. That's the only th- that's the only thing that sure. matters, and and that is in itself is a very different <laughs> identity. It's still patriarch, um, no matter where it is or isn't. Um, but it's painted in a lot of different ways, and so it wasn't until college that I really started to grapple with like, okay, but what does it mean to to be black here? And like, what does it mean to be black in my body? And what does it mean to be black at this private Christian university of predominantly white people? And now what does it mean to be black in a setting of political uproar and social justice, things that are just spiraling out of control. And I can't help but feel very numb to it and very awake to it. Um, Mm. And yeah, we're not talking about it in our, in our churches. Like, and, and so there was just so much that erupted out of me and it, and it really comes down to yes, political, but also this idea of being disembodied. I think for me, a lot of what I was given was was routes of disembodiment and that included my body that included my blackness that included my sexuality and my femininity and all of that it was like how I I think and not that I was intentional but that's just what it ended up being is this constant plucking of these identities that made the fullness of what it means to be a person and whether we know it or not a political person and so yeah I think that was the first Mm -hmm. round of it for me and then it just sort of snowballed into a lot of other different worlds well speaking about disembodiment i grew up evangelical also and in an evangelical town and everyone Mm -hmm. went to christian college so we probably Mm -hmm. had a very similar upbringings in that way and one thing that i did not realize until i was in my early 30s was how you said disembodied Mm -hmm. how we are not supposed to be in our bodies we are not supposed to take pleasure in our bodies we are not supposed to allow anybody else pleasure in mm-hmm. looking at our bodies. Mm-hmm. We are not supposed to. It's like it's almost like I didn't realize how detached I was from all of this. I knew it had to look a certain way. I knew I had to dress a certain way. <laughs> and I also knew that I was pushing really hard against yeah. that. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm I'm a bisexual woman, and so I never fit in well with evangelicals. But <laughs> I had to assimilate, right? Yeah. So I, I was never even tempted to try to do it, but that shame still yeah. rode with me everywhere. It was mm-hmm. just this constant companion. There's a great mm. book by Linda K. Klein called I think it's called Shame. No, it's called Pure. Have you read that? It's about yeah. evangelical childhood, and yeah. yes, it's so good. Mm-hmm. And I read it, and I was crying every day as I listened to it driving just crying because I had thought I was over Mm -hmm. it I also mourned my relationship with a church yeah because I never fit in and it was like but there's so much I love I love listening Mm -hmm. to a sermon an Mm -hmm. uplifting sermon yeah I think it's like it's peaceful Mm -hmm. so how do you in your life now when you think about it how do you do both Mm -hmm. Well, I think I I think that's was the first thing is that it's I'm not doing both. I think because so much was like this is that. So this is me Ari doing poetry in the secular world and then this is me Ari doing poetry and yoga and other things in the Christian world. It it became so like I always say like I teeter on this thin line. <laughs> And now I'm realizing there is no line. (laughs) Now I'm realizing like it's it's more it's more like this than it is like, you know, this. And so I think for me, I just had to realize again, coming back to that, it all belongs. And I think really like me tapping back into my body, I, I think the first note I got was like, how do we expect? I think for me, I'm at a point where it's like, how do we expect to input so much hate? hate towards our bodies, hate towards who we are, hate towards, you know, how we operate, because that's ultimately what the language is around, you know, um, sin and purity culture was, was a self-hatred. Um, so how do we expect to input all yeah. this 
hate and expect that our output is going to be love. Like, and I would say like the math is not mathing. Like that doesn't add up. I, that doesn't work. So how then do I balance that out and how do I unify it? And it's like, no, I get to love myself. Like I get to love my body. And, and that has been a constant thing I'm always challenged on, even to this day, um, by people who have known the journey of who I am and, and, and people from college, you know, messaging me of like, oh, I rem I miss when you, when you basically helped me feel bad about myself. Um, like I literally oh, had wow. it, someone smokes. say like, I, 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 she was like, I miss when you wouldn't tell people that they were enough. Like I, yeah. and, and now you're this yogi da, 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 telling people that they're worthy. And I'm just like, I responded. I just, I'm sorry. You hate yourself so much that you cannot see that all I'm trying to do is like actually pull you closer to self and closer to divinity, whatever that means for you in a safe and life-giving way. Um, and, and, and she compared me to another, another speaker person who I absolutely cannot stand. And I said, if, if that's who you want, you go about it. But I am nowhere okay. in the vein or heartbeat of what that woman does, says, or stands for. And and so have fun. I think she still follows me, though. So I'm doing something nope. <laughs> that she can <laughs> recipe with. Well, but I did get a lot of that of just like, you know, I miss when you when you when when you told people about God and not themselves. And I'm just like, I think we really lost the point if we think they're not very coexistent. Yeah, I, we we talk a lot about um, uninvited Buddhas on this show. Uh, mm. This started with I've always called my kids. I have an 11 year old and a 14 year old, and you don't have kids yet, do you, Ariel? Yeah. Nope. You don't have kids yet, right? So, um, so oh, I call oh. my kids my Buddhas because they've taught me a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and I've resisted I resisted a lot. That. And so I we, we talk that. a lot about uninvited Buddhas. Yeah. Oh my God, my mm. husband, uninvited Buddha. 100. <laughs> I mean. You know, they come in all these different forms from people mm. that just that, that we, we actually do care about. And then other times I feel mm. like they can come in the form of, oof, you know, people that are maybe outside of our, our, our yeah. intimate sphere, but they can get under our skin. And my very strong feeling is they are there for a reason. And yet, you know, we'll resist and reject and, and resent. So I'd be curious, do you have an uninvited Buddha? And, and I should add. What's key to me is that there is something to learn from these people that that we are resisting. And so I'm just curious um, yeah, if there's somebody in your life when you think, ooh, yeah, that uninvited Buddha had something to teach me. Mm. I mean, I, I would definitely say that m my husband is definitely a, a, an uninvited Buddha. And I, I write about that <laughs> in the book. I'm just like, um, yeah, I'm just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know. I don't know what you're about to do or what you're about to teach me, but it's like mm -hmm. that balance of like, I don't know if I'm ready for it. And if I am ready for it, I don't know yeah. if I want it. And if I do want it, I don't know if I want it to come from you. <laughs> you know, it's like very oh, much so true. like all like true. three of those things. But he, I mean, I, I say like he, he, he woke a sleeping part of me and like gave permission mm -hmm. for a sleeping part of me. And, and then I would say my niece, is my uninvited Buddha. She is three years going on 60. And she is uh -huh. just just so vibrant, so full of life, so assertive and 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 strong. And she's does not operate like a regular three year old. She's always like going places and trying to be people's friends and people don't know how to respond to her. I actually I wrote a poem recently where I talked about things that I'm jealous of and I I am talk about being jealous of my niece nice. and how she like went up to this little girl who was much older than her and was like oh do you want to be my friend and the girl just like kind of shied away and then my my niece literally turns to me she goes well guess she doesn't like me and then she went to the lion cage and started to try and wake a sleeping lion in in the oh, zoo wow. and i'm like who who are you like what is this being, I'm just like, so just like, and we're moving on. And now I'm going to be bold enough to go wake this sleeping yeah. animal that is yeah. five oh, times that's my so size. so beautiful. And so she is, she is definitely, <sighs> definitely my, my, 
my um what did you call it Inten- unintentional buddha right uninvited now. buddha yeah, yeah no uninvited that's amazing buddha. let me rewind to your husband because yeah. I've, i found some similarities um uh you and i share a love at first sight story so mm-hmm. your husband is john mine is sanjay i laid eyes on yeah. him i was like oh yo i'm in trouble <laughs> uh-huh. um and i read i i confess i'm not entirely through your book but when I think about what you described in in him um, unwakening parts of you, what I mm. read in the book is it sounded quite pleasant and like a like mm. a fairy tale. And I'm wondering how yes. much of it was not that was was painful and and where there yeah. was resistance. And I always say with my yeah. husband, it's fireworks of the best and worst kind. So mm. how how was that? That I mean, was it was it smooth or pretty jaggedy? Oh no! It's funny that you say that because I, I, I genuinely thought I was, I was close to writing a tell-all with this one. I mean, it's like one of the most like vulnerable and honest I've, I've been with myself, um, and especially when it involved yeah. uh, other people in my life. And so I was, I was borderline sick <laughs> throughout writing this book because I was like, "Am I saying too much? Am I, am I being disrespectful? Am I, am I not being truthful to what, to what I need to be truthful to?" Like that was constantly going through my head, and and I, and I tried to paint. You know, I think I say like people think engagements are all these like fun things. It's, it's, it was not fun for us, and our engagement was very, very hard. Mm-hmm. Um, us meeting felt so. Okay easy in a sense of it felt so aligned it felt so like even the idea of it perfect like the the definition of perfect does not mean pristine without any blemishes perfect means as good as it could be as good as it's meant to be and Mm. and so we use that term a lot when it comes to us because we're like it was kind of perfect like we just were we met each other at the right time Um, it was the moment I saw him physically and in person, I was like, oh my goodness, like uh, this is the man of my dreams (laughs) and I'm either like really in trouble or like this is going to go really well or both. (laughs) Like I just knew that he was going to come and like, and, and mess some stuff up. (laughs) So, um, and I was ready for it at the same time. And I didn't, I didn't fully understand what he would make home to. Um, and what he would create space for, but I really needed it um, at the same time. But us meeting was aligned. It was when it it started to add other people um, and other opinions and other factors that it started to get messy. But when it came to us, like when it comes to us, like we have our we have our bickers and we have our little arguments and we see the world very differently. But when it when it, it comes to the end of the day, like he is my favorite person t- to do life. Sure. Um and and to build with and um even in our sure. yin yanging um it it feels very still connected and and yeah it was hard because I I genuinely was like um you are everything I feel like I'm not supposed to want and yet it's everything I absolutely right. think I I need but why do you um, hang on I gotta I've gotta pause and ask you what do you what do you mean by you're everything that did you say I'm not supposed to want what what do you yeah, mean by that? in a sense of like for me it was coming back to I'm a pastor's kid I'm a Baptist pastor's kid so I'm not he's not in the church every Sunday he has no Bible verse in his bio um he he says what? well things about God that open and unlocks doors that I'm not supposed to be opening and or unlocking. Okay. And yet he makes me feel so close and connected to this God without chains and the, and this embodiment without shame. And and that's what it was that's right. what I was drawn to. And that's what I felt home in of like, oh, is there more to this is it right here? And that's it. And he he really let me have space to just explore and to wonder and to ask those questions and so it, I think it comes from that oldest child energy of like um very much so yeah, people tend like I gotta marry rich I gotta I gotta be the oldest I gotta keep things so you know it was very much that energy and I just was like yeah but what if I love him because I am still a hopeless romantic so what about that mm-hmm. and um and and that's really what it came down to was like oh I think you may not be what others expect of me and yet you're everything that I know the fullest version of myself can be home to oh wow that's 
I know my heart. Holy cow. <laughs> we I have mean, a video like... clip queued up here because um, I sent it to Brian today and I said, we we have to talk about this. So <laughs> I love this. This is, this is a, we're going to show it here for those who are watching it. It, yeah. um, it is Ariel showing what her husband's life is like with her having a public presence. Brian, can you roll that for us to watch quick? Sure. We, Ariel, will you describe what's happening oh in this clip? Oh my gosh, yeah. So we, we are, so I'm in um, like Los Angeles area and we woke up so one Sunday and we're like, let's go to Santa Barbara, like just for the day, let's just go. So we go, so we're having a Santa Barbara date date and I'm like, okay, this is a cute vibe. There's this little tree, the window lighting is so good. I like the color of this mug. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna record. <laughs> he, I had started recording while he was going to go get the coffee. And then I kept a recording when he brought the coffee. And so we're having our moment. I am a professional. So I'm not looking at the camera. My husband, however, could care less <laughs> about what I'm trying to create. And there are moments that I've dragged him into shoots. I've dragged him into content stuff. And he 100% is a trooper and also my biggest troll. And so in this video, he just, <laughs> he would not let it be fully cute. And I kept it. I'm like, there's, I could have not kept it. I could have just had it really, really cute and it could have been really cute. Um, but I kept it because I was like, no, this is us. <laughs> like, this is him. And yeah. and he really, I mean, it's funny because we met on Instagram. Like, we met through Instagram. Um, and I think I had like maybe like 10K when we first met. And he just was like, not, not, not impressed by it, but just not really phased and i think that's why i fell in love with him because i'm like this means nothing to you which means you will keep me grounded forever (laughs) and i need yeah Uh, good for you good yeah good yeah good instinct there (laughs) there are loads of videos about relationships especially now with tiktok taking off it where you know they're doing it together and sometimes it's so cute and collaborative and the husband's (laughs) being such a good sport or the wife's being such a good sport yeah. But there are not very many like that where you can see a person's <laughs> character. He loves you. He's there. He's going along with it. But he's mm-hmm. still his own person. He's not that like Instagram husband from no. that trend like five or eight years ago. Oh my gosh. And yeah. I find that so, I don't want to say attractive because I'm not saying I'm attracted to your husband, but I find that attractive. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. bit you. Come on, Joanna. I mean, tell the truth. Listen, he's super cute. He's super cute. He We're is on the same page, cute. Sir. 100%. But like for me, that independence and that yeah. complete lack of fawning yeah. is so yeah. awesome. And that moment he, you he, captured there, thank goodness you posted it. Yeah, he breaks the third wall for me all the time. And I and I need it um, to like make me, to remind me of my humanity. Um, like I often say like, Ariel, a story is my middle name. And that's also become this like Hannah Montana person um, that I can't be all the time, you know, like that I can't be on like that all the time. Like I can't be approachable and warm and as inviting and interacting and charismatic as I as I am when I'm in that space because it's not it's not sustainable all the time. It's still very much so me um, and it's still very much so authentic to who I am and how I operate, but I can't be that on all the time. And he has seen all the versions of Ariel Astoria, Ariel Astoria Wilburn, Ariel Astoria Corfi is now my last name, but he's seen all of it. And so I think for me, it's just like, yeah, I think I I need that. I need the reminder that social media is not real life. I need the person who's going to yeah. pull me on a mm-hmm. hike and and make me be outside and not record it. You know, like I need, yeah. I, I yeah. need that mm-hmm. because of the worlds so that I sit in and that I live does in. He, does he ever get frustrated with your public life like for me i don't have nearly Mm -hmm. as public a life as you have but it when my husband and i had kids which was 19 years ago but (laughs) we've been raising these kids throughout yeah my public career and he felt really strongly no faces no first names the kids do not belong you may not you you, i don't want you talking about them and this was a time when parent bloggers were taking off and there were opportunities and he was like we are not yours. Mm-hmm. We are all in this together. Some people mm-hmm. found it very confining, but now that my kids are grown up, I'm like, 
or some of my kids, thank God. Some little ones. Yeah, well, thank thank goodness you didn't, I'm right? Glad. Don't you feel grateful? Yeah, I feel because yeah. there's like I that backlash. I feel grateful. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel bad saying that because so many of my good friends, uh, especially you when, know uh, friends yeah. who are parent, who were parent bloggers with me, have had their kids public. I'm not saying they're making the wrong decision. No, but does your husband ever go like, I don't want this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he'll he'll definitely. Sh- tell me when like I don't have capacity for this or I don't have a capacity to be that for you or in that space while still being there you know like he he still will come to my shows he'll still record for me he'll still but like he won't I think what it comes down to is he won't do the pretend thing and whether we we think we're we're being intentional with it or not a lot of times with social media it's still planned it's still curated it's still so it's Mm -hmm. still pretend and one thing that i love about him is like for me as an oldest child as as you know a a daughter eldest daughter as a pastor's kid i still have so much like around people pleasing and and appeasing and being presentable Mm -hmm. and he really helps me like balance that out of like no but like i I can't pretend here that doesn't feel aligned or good to me or I can't offer you anything in that and being very honest with me in that and being that, honest yeah. with other people. And so he definitely, I mean, like I said, we've done, there's some Lululemon campaigns you can find us in. There's some, we did a lot for REI, oh, which yeah. actually he was really excited about that because he's such an outdoorsy kind of human. So REI, he My husband would love on to do REI. My husband yeah. would jump right in front of the camera if fully it were REI. On board. Yeah. So I tried <laughs> to find things where I'm like, not just asking him to be in my content because I know it's going to get great engagement that's the other thing is he knows it gets good engagement that's i think that's one of my top performing videos on on oh, in the last nice. like, few months and he'll just like i'll like be excited about views on something and he'll just go back to that one video circle it and be like yeah but but then also at the same time he's like but i'm not just gonna be in stuff just to be in stuff you know or just to get stuck but doesn't yeah. say a lot about real authenticity right that's yeah. it's like you can't mac manufacture no. authenticity right so no. props to john no. but hang on we gotta yeah. i want to cover a few more things yeah we started with your book we started with the unfolding and i yeah. want to read something beautiful from your book mm, and then ask you please. um an important question or two burning okay. question you say in order to let something in you have to let some things go in order to heal, you must hurt. In order to grow, you will experience discomfort. And all of this is to make room for hope, uh, is to make more room for hope, less room for perfectionism, and more room for simply being, less room for answers, more room for questions with integrity, for mystery and wonder that leads you somewhere new, not right or wrong, good or bad, this is the unfolding. And so I would just, I mean, as somebody who has been seeking for a very long time, who has mm. a lot of love in my life, but also just a lot of hurt and heartache and doubt mm. and fear that I've struggled to overcome. I mean, your words really spoke to me. Okay. How do you manage the doubt and the fear and the resistance? Right. I mean, because looking mm. at you and listening to you, it's like, oh, look, she got it all figured out. Look, at she's like she's glowing. And yet when you read these words, it's like you went through the crucible. Yeah. Right. So just like yeah. how how do you go through that? Yeah. Um, I'm an Enneagram four, so I don't mind shadow seasons. Um, I'm also a double Libra, so I really don't mind sitting in things that need to be sat in. Um I yeah. there's like I think an encapsulation of me is like high school not really experiencing a heartbreak or anything but just being obsessed with dreaming with a broken heart by John Mayer and like fully laying on my bedroom floor lights off just there right. feeling and my sister's being like what is wrong with you and I'm like I'm just here just just observing mm. just feeling yeah, just so, being so and relate so I think for me it's just I, the grief and 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 the pain and the discomfort and the unfolding, I, like I say in the in the book, the eclipsing season, it it's not fun, you know. Like it's not something I I would really not like to relive it. 
but I but I also know and acknowledge and find gratitude for having to live it um, in order to be at, on this side of things. And I and still on this side of things, I still get a lot of anxiety for not going to church every Sunday. I still have a lot of anxiety around having conversations with with church related friends and family and not and not talking about God or church related things all the time. Like I still have a lot of shame around um, just a lot of body things and a lot of intimacy things. And and I'm still very involved in yoga. And I still have moments where I'm like, oh, but was that sound bath a little too far? Like I still go there and, and and it's all part of it because that's the thing. It's not a destination. It's a journey. And I think it's a journey until we're not here anymore. Um, but the goal is that we constantly get more free more alive, more whole along the way. Um, and we learn from those things and, and, and know that they're seasonal, know that they are not forever. Um, and so how can we not fight it while we're in it, but be like, okay, what am I supposed to learn here? Who am I supposed to become after this? And well, and that, that takes trust, you. right? Because I feel like it's yeah. in my life. I think it's been the, the, just the profound doubt that says, will will this pass right yeah. and and it's like on the one hand intellectually you know it won't but when you're in that crucible and it's so painful and you're just for me when i'm experiencing just so much doubt it's like mm -hmm. oh will this pass yeah, yeah. right or, yeah. or and yeah. where is it going well I you... oh go ahead join up well i want to pull out one thing ariel said in there that just popped into my head Ariel, when I look at you and I followed you a long time on social media and we did an article about you here, your tango, you remember I, I interviewed you. So I've been a fan for a long time. When I look at you, I see somebody who never doubts the worth mm -hmm. and value of their body, who mm. never has a problem with how the world sees you. And so I yeah. heard you say in there, you start to feel some remnants of that, maybe yeah. old oh. shame or not acceptance. Yeah. So, to me, that just felt like oh, my eyes just went like, oh, my mm -hmm. gosh, they're open. Mm -hmm. I thought you had it all figured out. And I'm failing mm -hmm. because I don't feel that all Isn't the time. Isn't that the downfall of social media is like we're yes. getting these like highlight glimpses. Like I'm showing you mm -hmm. exactly what I want you to see. And that's why I challenge myself with like I think I had a post a few weeks ago of like, being on set and I, I didn't hear and I literally was like crying on the van home and I was like in my car like sobbing in my stories like I really try yeah, to nah, show nah. all of it because I'm like we yeah. so we see so little in these spaces and it, it it's just like I think that's a reminder of like yeah I'm not showing you every moment that I'm like I had my potato yeah. bees is what I call them. Like where I just, I don't feel good. I feel very bad. Yeah. I feel like potato days. Body. That's a good one. Yeah. Potato like days. I feel not in my body, but like most of us are, yeah. are tuned into everyone showing their Beyonce days. Everyone showing their yeah. days where they look the best, feel yeah. the best, are doing the best. <laughs> you know, like that's what yeah. we show. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well then of course our brains are going to be wired then to like, well, I suck i'm yeah. not doing nothing there's and i have those moments too and that's when i'm like and it's time to give out because i have that constant reminder of time like, to this get is off not real yeah. life this is not real life and so that's why i love conversations that's why i love in real life moments because if you ask yeah. me how i'm doing that day i'll probably be like you know been better been better but like yeah i won't always do that on social media because it's just a different front facing thing you know yeah mm -hmm. Hey, Ariel, will you, speaking of um, just show, you know, the the revelations in your poetry, um, will you read Arise or, yeah. or one of the other ones that we sent? Do you have that handy? Because I just, yeah. I love, I mean, I, I as I said, Arise is a uh, anagram for Aries. And mm -hmm. I just, I felt like it was so, yeah, exactly. We are the Aries chicks. Um, I love it. I just, I loved the rawness in that too. And the rawness mm. and the hope. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, this is a ride. I thought I was crazy. I thought my tears were a blinded weakness, that my feelings were distracted foolishness, that I could not trust the voice inside of me whispering, beckoning me into the uncharted unknown that was deemed ungodly. 
This was not a breaking, though there was a bending occurring. This was a reckoning, an awakening. I found the divine in the brokenness. In the evenings when I sobbed myself to sleep, asking for clarity, begging to be shown something maybe I couldn't see. I was not crazy. The stirring in my chest guiding what came next, my tears not blinding me, but clearing a perspective that was no longer mine. This voice, no longer buried inside, led me here to this love, this wild and beautiful love. This was no insanity. This was awake. Oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. Such beautiful, profound words. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Um, and in the spirit of uh, poetry, uh, getting a lot yeah. of attention lately, what do you think of the name of uh, Tay-Tay's new album, The Tortured Poets Absolutely Department? Not. Absolutely not. Ah. I No? I have a lot of thoughts. I think I posted this on my close friends, actually. See? Social media. I'm like, when I just posted the like her post, I don't, I'm going to say, I don't know where she's going to go with it. Um, so I will mm-hmm. say that. Um, I will say um, also in my jealous poem that I mentioned earlier, I mentioned Amanda Gorman. So I guess I'm adding Taylor Swift to that oh, right. line as well. I think it's just hard sure. for poets uh, who are trying to like get there. And then there's like this person who is like, I'm here now. And you're like, cool. I can go in a hole now. Um, but I think I've gone to the point also where I learned that like the way that I show up and write is going to be wildly different than whatever it is that Taylor Swift does. I do think it's more a play on the idea of that like phrasing um, than anything else. But I also have an album coming out for spoken word. So Watch out, Taylor. I guess. <laughs> when is that going to be released? Um, hopefully this year. So it, it'll be an extension of the book. So the book is The Unfolding. This will be the art of the unfolding. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just more poems and more conversations, some that are in the book and some that aren't. But it will be all to music. And it's been I, I listened to one, uh, one of the tracks right before this episode. And yeah, I'm very, very excited about it. Yeah. Wow, congratulations. We can't wait. Thank you. It's just, a, it's such a beautiful book. Um, mm. Joanna, do we have any other burning questions before we wrap up? Because I feel like we're just getting to time right now. I think I covered all of my big things. I guess I, I have a question. What would you say to a young woman who is growing up in a religion where maybe she doesn't feel like she fits, maybe specifically yeah. an evangelical kid? Um, what would you say to that girl who's feeling like she either has to betray herself mm. and follow her own heart or betray her family and her church? Yeah. I think the one thing that will cause us to toss and turn in our graves is the betrayal of ourselves. I would mm. hope and pray that along the way, like, as you become the version of you that exists today, that the people alongside you will come alongside you. Um, And and really trust that. And also give grace and patience to letting people catch up to the version of you that does exist today. And so whether it, I Mm -hmm. think we, that shifts and change a lot. Friendships change. You know, I don't have the same friends I had in the second grade or, you know, in middle school. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I've, I'm still friends with one, a few people from high school, um, but th- that's about it, you know? And so I think just learning to, yeah, trust yourself and, and trust, trust that you're not crazy. Trust that the beckoning that's calling you is to wholeness um, and not to aloneness. I think when we become our fullest selves, mm-hmm. that automatically gives permission and patience permission and acceptance for other people to do the same and I think maybe that's where you find your people but I think I probably would have yeah I don't I think I would have killed a version of myself or you know put to sleep a version of myself that was 100% supposed to live and exist um and that would have been a death within itself and so yeah I think you know I say uh leave flowers for all the past versions of yourselves for they are the soil in which you now bloom. Yes. And so it's okay if you need to let some versions of yourself to rest and let, let who needs to I, bloom I love bloom. your reference of soil. 
as part of our lives. Mm-hmm. That, like that you've used that word a few times yeah. and as a gardener. It's just, ooh, it's such a yeah. great, powerful metaphor, right? And you can enrich the soil and you know, you can take that metaphor. Andrea has been saying a lot about compost. Andrea's been talking a lot oh. about when we make mistakes or things go wrong, turn it yeah. into compost for yeah. the soil in which you're growing. And I, I just love that. Like, oh, love that. Yeah. yeah. And even as a creative person, it's like, oh my gosh, all mm-hmm. the stuff you write, 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 or all the, I don't know about yeah. you, but you know, as I do some social media stuff, I'll, I'll even like make fun of myself where it's like, oh, that was my 11th take. <laughs> you know, like yeah. the first 10 are compost. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Keep yeah. it real. Yeah. The um, I wanted to ask you this one last quick thing. When you were just, t- you know, talking about that kind of having that, that um, what did you say? You know, that you would like kind of roll over in your grave if you're not true to yourself and, and what that, you know, what that means to, to others, right? And, and the trust and the truth. So I was just curious, um, you um, commented on, on the um, kind of the blowback that Lizzo got after um, some missteps, uh, shall we say. And as I understand it, you saw her as a bit of a big sis and that you had to undo your belief in a celebrity you truly admired. So how did, how, I mean, was it uncomfortable for you to talk about this? Did you know her personally? I mean, I would just love to hear about this because that can be, I mean, that takes a lot of, I mean, back to courage to, you know, to maybe to address these things that just go against your own beliefs. Um, I don't know Lizzo personally. Um, I do know uh, one of the dancers who came out with the conversations and um, and and she was someone who had fell in love with in the show and really felt connected to you. And so when all of the things came out, one, I will say none of us know the full story except for the people who experienced it. So there's that part of it. But the two is what we do know. I was like, I guess this is where my disappointment came in of just like, whether what had happened happened or not, I I watched how Lizzo and Lizzo's team responded to it. And I think that's what broke my heart the most. And it only broke my heart because even how she responded to it contradicted the way that she has shown up and presented herself um, to us as fans and to us as people who ad- admire her. And she was one of my favorite concerts last year um that that my husband and I had gone to we had gone to Adele who had seen twice which she will always be top tier for me but Lizzo was my first time experiencing her and I just cried I felt so in my body I felt alive and sexy and fun and cool and I was just so erupting and then for something like that to happen after having watched the show it just was hard to watch and and was frustrating because I don't know all of the pieces I don't know her intention or not her intentions and I think that was really frustrating but it broke my heart for that reason because I think I tried to be a person who is as transparent and as aligned in any world that I sit in that when people interact with me randomly in a coffee shop or at a, at a bookstore when I'm signing a book that I'm still that person that they experience or see on social media that's like really important to me and I think more often than not, we see that really contradict a lot of times, which is, uh, I think it's just a human thing. I think that's when we remember. Yeah, that you talked so beautifully about truth and how it's like how so often people are uncomfortable in truth because so many people are are, are hiding, right? And it, it almost feels like, and you were talking a few minutes ago too about betrayal, right? And how we feel bad about ourselves when we betray ourselves. Right. And, it, you know, it just it sounds like listening to you talk about just that disappointment. It almost feels like a betrayal, like you you had this expectation of somebody you admired and then they didn't own it. And it just it's it's a because when I think about the opportunity to screw up and then make it right. I mean, we talk a lot about do overs with our kids, Joanna. Right. We talk about saying, okay, let me make the repair you know, if you will, coming clean. And I just, I feel like that's, you know, that's something that I hold dear. And so I, I, you know, I, I kind of feel it in my body, that disappointment, um, hearing this, because it's just like, oh, there was such an opportunity to do something totally different. Wait, I missed the story about Lizzo. What happened? So she had a few dancers come out about their own personal experiences of how they encountered 
not just Lizzo, but also Lizzo's team. Um, some of it ranging from some sexually inappropriate conversations and interactions that they were uncomfortable with, some of it ranging to professional, um, just mishandling and miscommunications, and just overall what they would call a, a toxic environment, um, which I think a lot of my friends who are in industry and who are artists were like, some of the things they mentioned were like, oh, that kind of feels industry, which sucks, but like, that's what it is. But they're yeah. all very new. They all were birthed from, most of them were birthed from this show or from the concept that Lizzo had of the big girls. And so in that response, they all kind of came forward about their own personal experiences with it. Um, and then of course, Lizzo's PR team came through and, and, and denied all of it and i'm like there was no part of it that was true there was no part that you're willing to own up to and and it just kind of mm. and so i could tell there was a lot of hurt on both sides which really which was really unfortunate but yeah it just was like a little bit of a shock what the accusations were because the accusation is in itself completely contradict what lizzo's music says and what she says she stands for so we were all kind of like we like yeah. what is happening i know so, i love her yeah i i i still I think love we her. can also like still make have a room lot of hope. for yeah i think we can also yeah. make room for what might happen in the future too right like maybe something will happen and we all I think make just, mistakes right <laughs> it's well, another it reminds reminder me of the of, like, queen of nice um i'm i'm blanking on her name queen of nice Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, uh, thank you. It, that's what it reminds me of. Remember, there oh, was a big I, I Ellen know. debacle. Yes. And it just yes. it does feel like it was just deny, deny, deny. And I yeah. understand yeah. that the PR, you know, industry will say just, just, just deny, 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 deny. And I guess sometimes mm -hmm. it works. Yeah. But I just, it's back to the authenticity and, you know, John the, helping you, you know, get one of your biggest yeah. clips by being authentic, yeah. being real, yeah. telling the freaking truth. Right, that's yeah. what we're called to Which do. Which is funny. He he's actually in in school for for PR and communication. So it'll be really interesting to see how we how we continue to develop. But yeah, I think ultimately it's just a reminder to you of humanity and and remembering that people are humans and we put celebrities and people on pedestals that they that humans aren't meant to be put on. I think it's so. I think those moments are just a reminder of like, hey, mm -hmm. we're all human, doing human and messy things, and. And how do we continue to live? Yeah. yeah, totally. All right, Arielle, you are a beautiful soul. Thank you for Thank being you. on Open Relationships. It was such a gift to talk to you. Yeah. All right, that is a wrap of Open Relationships. And you can follow Arielle on um, Instagram at Arielle Astoria. Uh, she has an amazing Substack, an amazing website. Let me give you that. Our, oh. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. It's a lot of letters. <laughs> and um, and then, of course, the beautiful new book, The Unfolding uh, by Harper yeah. One. Uh, you can get it wherever books are sold. And um, I do encourage you to check it out because it is a it is a gift. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. Yay! All right, it's a wrap. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another amazing edition of Open Relationships Transforming Together. If you have feedback or advice for us, please email us at openrelationships at yourtango.com. We are just trying to create a show that you love, so please follow us and uh, download and all those things. Um, subscribe, whether you're finding us on iHeart, Spotify, YouTube, you name it. And we also welcome your comments on uh, these various platforms. And I think that's it. Brian, anything I forgot? Yeah, let us know if there's any guests you want us to have on the show. And we'll try and reach yes. out. Yes. All right. We take your guest requests as well. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.